Everyone, yes. let's welcome Noelle Stevenson to Dragon Talk. Yay. Thank you for having Woo. me. I'm excited to be here. We're so glad you're here. <laughs> After some technical difficulties in which technology kicked my ass repeatedly, I am finally here and I can both see and hear you and it's exciting. It is exciting. It's very, very exciting. I love all the things that you've been doing with uh, with Shira. Getting season five, how does it feel to have all of it out into the world? I it has been just so incredible. Like it, it's just been this huge, honestly, like relief when you make a cartoon. You're working on it for so long before anyone even know before it's even announced, before it even has like a name that people know. Um, and you're just hoping the whole time because you're like deep in the weeds and you're like, I really hope that people like this. I really hope it hits the way we want it to hit. You never know. So it's very scary, honestly. Um, and so one, for me anyway, once it's like out in the world and people are like, oh, I saw that thing you did. That that makes sense to me. I like it. Like it, for me, it's just so affirming because I'm like, oh my God, thank God. Now this thing that's been like living in my head for so long is now living in lots of other people's heads. So hearing that people are watching it and enjoying it and having a good time is just like, for me, I've been sleeping like a baby every night, just like so happy that it's finally just all out there. Yeah. <laughs> and it was so well received from the very second it dropped. Like, I mean, people just really glommed onto it. I remember watching that first episode and just smiling the whole way through it. Like, Cause I, I watched she when I was a kid and it was just like, this is amazing. Like this, it's just got the right <laughs> balance. Like there's great humor, but there's great adventure. And then the storylines and the characters. And it just, it totally spoke to me. I was telling Greg uh, earlier in our intro that I, I knowing that you were going to be our guest, I'm like, I'm inspired to like rewatch, like at least like season one again. And I, I had my son, I'm like, do you want to watch, want to watch a show with me? And he was like, <laughs> Is it your housewives? No, it's, wow. it's actually not this time. Um, yeah, yeah, you know me too. He well. was like, "No, thank you." But he he actually like he has an attention span. Like if he's not into something within the first couple of minutes, he's like, "This is boring," and he goes no. and he gets his iPad, and he just like nestled right in, and he he goes, "This is actually good." wow yes this is the and highest we, honor I, and he really like me attention of, of judgmental young yes kids is yes and he was music like to my ears <laughs> he loved and i love glimmer as well and he Aww. loved glimmer and he spent the rest of, of the night like going mom god like, <laughs> Oh no! I don't do anything. You're showing kids how to sass your parents. Totally. <laughs> so backfiring. Like, yep. They knew it already. I was very proud. Yes. I was like, yes, mm -hmm. yes, it's it's great. <laughs> it's just it's so much fun. So congratulations on on all of that so success. Much. Yeah, I love all the baked in D and D fantasy ness of it too. Like it just it it, it uh, uh, brought so many fun things to life, even more so than uh, you know than I remember the the, the show uh, back in the eighties. So, yeah, How, you've been playing yeah. D and D for for a long time, right? I actually I started playing D and D for the first time about when I was first starting on Shira. So it's oh. only been about five years for me, um, and it's I I think it's really cool because. I, in my head, they're very like woven together. Like those are two experiences that were kind of happening at the same time. So a lot of my experiences from D and D went into Shira. There's like this episode um, in season one where they go to Entrapta's castle, and it was kind of based on like um, uh, a session that my now wife, um, at the time girlfriend, uh, was running for us, where we all were in this kind of like Beauty and the Beast mansion that was crewed by robots. And so like with her permission, like I was really like inspired by that, especially because like my character was sort of like the basis for Glimmer's character. Mm. So I oh. like, as soon as I unlocked, I was a tiefling warlock. So very much like she sold her soul to a devil just to make her moms mad. And like, <laughs> so, and, and I, um, as soon as I unlocked Misty's step, I was like, I, it was a nightmare for Molly because I was just like, I would, if any conceivable situation in which I could use Misty step, I would use it. So in this session, uh, we were at this mansion. We had to like go up to the front door and I was like, door will be locked. We need another way in. Um, and so I managed to use Misty Step, like a complicated, this shouldn't have worked. Molly is very kind at the DM. <laughs> Let me do my, uh, my complicated schemes. But I had a pseudo dragon familiar and I could see through his eyes. 
So he flew up to like the top level, looked in through the window. And then I was like, you can misty step to wherever you can see. I can see inside. And so oh. I stepped into the top level of what turned out to be a three-story indoor, like uh, what's it called? Like an arbitorium. Mm. So like not a floor, just a drop. So I, I misty stepped inside and then fell to what in real life would have been my desk. But in this game turned out to be the final boss act of the game. Uh, so I was like fighting these plant monsters. And meanwhile, my teammates just went up to the door, found it to be unlocked. Oh, there no. Was <laughs> there was a feast. They all got new clothes while I'm like sprinting through this like indoor forest being chased by plant monsters. Um, yeah. So anyway, I drew a lot of inspiration from that for Glimmer's teleporting because like, you know, like Misty Step, which you only have like, like one or two slots for, is very limited and you can get yourself into more trouble than you can get yourself out of sometimes. So that's like, I don't know. I felt like the experience of D&D &D was so wrapped up in my conception of the characters and the world and like, and, and how we were interacting with the world. Because like, just like when you're playing D&D, &D, these characters are just like, they're they're like they've decided what roles they're going to play and they're trying to fit those roles mm. but sometimes they roll really badly and they don't do a great job of like fitting into those roles all the time i love that you're using like two I... senses of the word role in there you're like well <laughs> yeah i know just keep up with it's it's wordplay yeah that's why they pay me the big bucks <laughs> <laughs> I like also that you said Molly is a very kind dungeon master, but as soon as you said that the door was unlocked the whole time. Yeah, I know. Kind I of. know. She's just she's <laughs> long suffering. I'm, I'm, the, I'm the kind of player where I'm always like, I just thought of a really cool thing. Can I do this? And she's like, no. Okay, fine. I guess so. Like, it's like, there's no reason that I should have been able to like use my pseudo dragon to like make my misty stuff stronger, but she lets me get away with stuff. So that's, that's awesome. so cool. Yeah, That's a good we, I, mean, I think I think we might have heard a version of that story from Molly when we interviewed her, oh uh, or at least about how some of her. Uh, was she just uh, like oh, Noelle and Misty Step? <laughs> I, I don't think we knew that it was inspiring an episode of She-Ra. Yeah, I she's she's a huge inspiration to me, and like just from the start, she's been like so influential on the shape of the show. Um, really cool to be married to a, a, a wife who has incredible storytelling instincts and is a great dm and all of those things she's a, she's a constant inspiration yeah it's well awesome. and it's, it's not just for for you to each other i think you're inspiring so many people uh with what you two are creating we were saying before too that like i don't think we've ever interviewed uh a a, a couple uh independently <laughs> on their independent projects about what they're yeah. doing and how it relates to D D. and so that's a true really, really cool true power couple <laughs> hashtag couple goals yeah it's like, fun i like it i like being in a power couple <laughs> i want swords as what, many swords wait. as possible oh yeah greg was definitely he was admiring the your wedding swords oh. i want more swords i know i want to go back in time to to my nuptials and have more he's, swords involved he's gonna do a vowel renewal Surprise his wife with many, many swords. <laughs> that makes it sound like I'm going to attack her. Though. I got more swords. <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> so what got you into, like, what was the impetus for playing D&D &D even five years ago? Just a um, curiosity? Because it was, again, going back to Molly, um, she had just moved to L.A. And she was uh, looking to make friends, but mostly I was looking to date her. And ah, so she nice. started this D&D &D session with people that like she wanted to be friends with. Um, and so, and I wanted to be friends with her and also to date her. So uh, <laughs> that was really like how it all started. But it was like something that I was really scared at first. Like Molly grew up LARPing and I was just like, this is all so complicated. I'm bad at math. Like what, I don't know if I'll be any good at this. Um, and then I just immediately was like, this is this experience that I never even knew I wanted. This kind of like just shared, like it, it feels like when you're a little kid and you're running around the playground and you're like, you're play, playing something together and you all have characters and like at some point, most of us stop being able to do that or we, or we get too self-conscious to do that. And I've always missed it. I think that working in animation, working on stories, that's my way of continuing to do that, to like share those imaginary worlds with people um, but D&D &D gave me that outlet in a way that was like, it doesn't have to be 
you know, it doesn't have to be my job. It doesn't have to be something that I'm writing for this broad audience. It can just be the shared experience between me and a few friends. So I think immediately I was just sucked into the magic of D&D um, and, and like got so invested in it and in my character and in the world, like I was playing this like angsty tiefling warlock who just like, she just like, in some like she's I think a lot and she's like a, a standard first D&D character you know that kind of like um chaotic evil just always ready to eldritch blast anything like you know she's always gonna blow everything up first chance she gets and it was really like but then there were moments of just like I was like that's that would be fun like that's what's fun to play a character who's just like chaotic but ultimately I ended up getting sucked into like the character dynamics as well. Um, another one of like Molly's friend Brennan, who runs another you know very successful like uh, live streamed D and D podcast as well. Is it Brennan uh, Mulligan playing... from Dimension yes. Twenty. Oh, yes. oh, I didn't realize awesome. that they were all yeah. in the same group together. Oh, that's fun. Oh, how yeah. fun! He was in my first campaign. He was playing a lawful good sort of Tracy Flick style halfling class president in our in our uh, <laughs> in our campaign, and like he and my character just immediately were like had so much tension. Some of it was romantic tension. Our characters did end up making out at some point. But um, a lot of it was just like this sort of like, um, just uh, just a matter of principles. Like it was like our characters did not see eye to eye and didn't see the world in the same way at all. And I remember it came to a head in this one episode where, you know, we just like, ended up on opposite sides of the conflict in this way. And we were just like in character having this like, this uh, spirited debate, I will say. And it was something where it was like, everyone was so sucked into this. Like we were our characters in that moment. And we were just like, through our character's eyes, just like, you know, trying to prove our point, trying to say what it was that like, we felt really strongly convicted. And I was getting so emotional. Like I was getting like pulled in, I was getting worked up. And it's just like the ability to sort of like, I think for me, what it ended up being was like unpacking certain feelings through this character, like teenage feelings that I've never quite gone back to. And now it's like through this world where I'm playing this messy, angsty teen, I can like deal with those things. And it was really cool. Like it was just like to share that with friends and to be in the situation where we felt safe to do that and just like have it out in this way through our character's eyes. Like, I, like that's like for me, as someone who's always trying to get to the heart of whatever any character is about, like that is like pure gold. Like that's what you look for. That moment when it's just that pure outpouring of emotion from your character. And I just, I, I, it was so cool. Um, since that then, sounds Brennan amazing. And I have been in other campaigns together where our characters are much better friends. So, but uh, <laughs> that first campaign was, it was, it was very, it was very fun. It was very, uh, it was an interesting dynamic between our characters. Did you think it was like that idea of, of uh, improvising together uh, in ways that you felt safe and able to do? And then were you then inspired again when you were writing uh, some of the stuff around, around She-Ra? They'd be like, oh, I can take, like, like you said, like how that uh, uh, one of the characters was inspiration for for one part of it, but then you mm -hmm. can just feel how all of what you were just describing about that dynamic is is kind of in the DNA of the whole show to a certain extent. Yeah, well, I think that there's something I do feel like it's in the DNA of the show, especially with like our core group of like Bo, Glimmer, and Dora. Like yeah. you've got Glimmer, who's always like, I can take him. Maybe her strength score isn't the highest, but she's got a bunch of cool spells. But like she always overexert, she always pushes a little too far ends up getting stuck places, running out of power, no spell slots left. The other two have to kind of swoop in and save her. And that's very frustrating for her. And then Adora, I feel like, is someone who, like, she has this really OP character. Stats are stacked. But I just always felt like she rolls really badly. Like, she just, like, I, I imagine her as having a really fancy, like, D20 that's like wrought iron or something. She got it as a gift. She re refuses to use anything else. But like, I feel like as anyone who's ever rolled with like really fancy dice knows, they never roll as well as the cheap plastic ones that cost like 50 cents. So like yeah. she, she has all of these powers and yet manages to always get in her own way and not be as powerful as she should be. And then someone like Bo, who's just like really, really like, he's very clever. Like he's very like, um, he's always like finding other ways around a problem or trying to figure out ways with his gadgets, with like different things that he's built. He's like a little bit of an artificer sometimes. And mm. so like 
all of these characters relationships and then to the roles that they're occupying where it's like Adora's like, I have to be a paladin. Glamour has to be a sorcerer. Bo has to be an ar a ranger. Like all of these things are roles that we've decided for ourselves that don't always fit or we're not always successful at them, which is, I feel like the experience of playing D&D, you know, you get to the place where it's like, I should be able to interpret this wall because I, I can, I have comprehend languages as a spell, but I rolled really badly. So I failed at doing that. And so finding ways to like incorporate that into the story and then finding ways in a world that's not D&D to find other ways that that like makes sense for the characters and for the world. How do they get in their own way? How do mm. they like, you know, see the world through the eyes of the role that they're trying to inhabit? And I feel like it's always been, I think my approach to writing characters is to sort of treat it a little bit as like what turned out to be, I think very similar to role playing. So like you put yourself in the character, you imagine you're playing as that character. And one thing that I found, like I was playing my angsty teen tiefling and that brought out a certain side of me, all of this kind of angst. And in a lot of ways, it was uncomfortable. I was like, I feel like I'm back in high school. Like, I feel <laughs> like I'm tapping into this like wellspring of like hot headed teen emotions that I haven't really expressed in a long time. You're like, I don't want to be fun. mad at my parents be... right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that angry in real life. Yeah. And so, my next campaign, I was like, I'm going to try and tap into a different part of myself. So, I played like a middle aged halfling who just really wants to take care of everybody and wants to be like motherly in some ways and like and that's also a piece of me you know and i think that like every character you play even if they're very very different from who you are you express some aspect of yourself and that's i think how i've always yeah. written characters I, you take every character and you're like i felt this way before this character feels this way right. and i can see the similarities between those things so i'm going to draw on my own emotions, my own feelings in order to express that character as genuinely as I can. And so I felt like D&D &D, like sort of, I, I maybe illuminated that some of that for me being like, oh, this is my process. Like this is like creating a character, even one that you're a little uncomfortable with or that doesn't quite fit you all the way. And then learning how to play through them is a really like helpful tool, I think for building characters in stories and, and making narratives around them and exploring how they see the world. So I think that it is like, you know, those two things happening at around the same time, I think it was really, they're really tied together. I think they're really uh, connected. Yeah, I I like that you immediately, like you, you're you playing D&D &D in a way, like, you know, these characters where you're, you're, you're consciously playing characters that are parts of you, mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't figure that out until like, <laughs> Like, why am I always gravitating towards these types of characters? Yeah. And then, you know, there is like, I think like this psychological side where it's like, yeah, are we trying to like safely express something that we don't feel like we can do in yeah. our real life? But it, you immediately picked up on that. And then you like not only yeah. picked up on it, but you're you're consciously doing that with your characters. I think that's really interesting. It's interesting, I think, you know, that first character, I, I do find it interesting in all that she is like, again, I think a pretty standard first D&D character for a lot of people because you I don't know if everybody people... does chaotic evil, uh, you know, no, I don't <laughs> Eldritch Blast yeah. and Warlocks first, first character. But... Yeah, exactly. I'm like, what? She looks like the devil? I love it. Sign me up. <laughs> um... <laughs> That was my and second also, character, think, actually. You expect, you're like, okay, well, I want to do, maybe in real life, like, I am, I'm not able to be chaotic because of, you know, social norms Society. that say, no, you have to work with the people around you. Maybe I want to express that chaotic nature by being mm. like, and then I shoot him and I suffer no consequences. But what you immediately learn is that there are consequences. And yet there's consequences for the people in your party, in the world. And immediately, like when you're playing a chaotic character and you don't want to, you know, suffer any consequences for it, especially Molly, like this is like, she is like, you did that. You have to pay the consequences for it. Even me, like being a warlock, she's like, and then your patron shows up and makes you do something you don't want to do. And I'm like, no, no, I just wanted to be a cool devil team. Please let me do that. She's like, nope. <laughs> mm, you have nope. to like pay the consequences. The and like, so I, I think that it's something that's interesting because I think that the other journey that I've been on through Shira is learning the value and how fulfilling it is to be community focused instead of being like, and I'm going to do this because I'm a rebel or blah. Like it's a little bit more of like, you start thinking of your team and what they need and what their characters need and what the NPC mm -hmm. that you need to help, what do they need? And I was also finding that at the same time through 
She-Ra. So ever since then, the characters that I make, I feel like they're characters, like right now I'm playing a bard who is like, he's like a changeling bard, but he's just this really, really sweet boy. And he just like never wants to fight anyone. He just always wants to help. He wants to like save the world, the power of music and togetherness. And he's also very, very dumb. <laughs> and so like all of these things make him really interesting to play. But like, whereas with my first character, she's the first into any fight. She's the first to like try and like shoot to kill. And this character, he's never struck a blow in the campaign so far. Hmm. He's just always like, I'm going to try and convince this bad guy not to fight us with the power of music. And I've always played high charisma characters, and I always roll really badly on charisma rolls. All of my characters have had some aspect of deception or shape-shifting. Every time I try and pull it off, I roll horribly, hmm. and I always fail at it. So this character, I use his, he's got really high charisma, but I only use it for convincing people to like be our friend. And I've never rolled better on my charisma rolls. Like suddenly oh, it's like, it's, it's actually working. I'll play my guitar for a giant spider that we're fighting and the spider will stop fighting. Like it is actually working. And like, it's like interesting the ways that you like, I, I really feel that through the characters you choose to play, you can like discover a little bit more about yourself as a person. Like maybe I do, maybe I don't want to be the like chaotic, like first into battle. Maybe I want to be someone who like, makes people happy and brings people together and like that's a part of me too so that's really awesome um and so yeah i got like kind of a follow-up kind of idea to that because uh, one thing i'm curious about we talked to a few animators who have come on here uh before but you know maybe there's people listening who don't really understand how the show running works for something like that and i imagine there's a lot of there's a big team we are all doing all the things and you're, you know, it's all going up to, to, uh, the decisions that you're making as well as, you know, other factors, but you know, that's a, that's a huge task to be able to lay at someone's feet. And I wonder if the, the character that you were just describing, I wonder if it's a little bit like, you know what, I don't want to be the person who's got the answers and is the leader, even in my play right now, because <laughs> of wanting to take a break from that role. Uh, so yeah. yeah, so yeah, talk a little bit about what it's like to to lead a team of people in creating something and then how that, you know, you might want have that infect the characters that you're playing with in the near future. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's something, it's like it's been a journey I've been on in general, just in my life. And I think that I've expressed that through D&D and through the show. But it's a shift from being kind of like, because like, before I was working in animation, I, I, I did everything myself. You know, I, I did comics, I drew and wrote them myself. I colored them, I lettered them. Okay. I, I didn't even go through a publisher for a while. Um, it, was, it was all just based on like what I could physically do myself. Animation, in a lot of ways, has a, I use similar skill sets for it, but in so many ways, it is so different. And it's because of that community aspect. So I, I entered the, the job, this huge job of show running, convinced that, you know, like I will just, you know, I know how to stand my ground. I know how to be strong. I know how to argue for what I want. I can do this because I have faith in my own like self drivenness, like my own ability to like, to like take hard knocks and, and, and stand my ground and all these things. And then getting into the job and realizing that that was actually not what was needed of me. It was something where it's like, oh, I am actually my job as the leader, as the boss is to be support in a weird way is to like because like my job is like if you have a board artist who's got a vision and there are various things that are getting in the way of them being able to express that vision you have to be on the ground level and you have to be the one sort of holding the door open and, and protecting them from anything that might get in the way or or cause problems so much of it is just empowering the people on your team to tell the story that like they need to tell and so even when it is like okay here's the story we're telling this is what i want to do it, it is like pointing the way you are trying to show people a clear vision of what you're doing but also like that is a little bit of a support role as well like you're doing that so that they can do their job the best that they know how if a background painter is like okay what do you what color do you want this and you're like oh i don't know maybe green maybe blue maybe purple i don't know figure it out like that's like that's very difficult for that background painter. Like yeah. they have to have the inform all the information possible in order to do the best job that they can. And so learning how to be like changing my tactic from being like, 
here I go. I'm misty stepping in with Eldritch Blast Blazon. And instead being like, okay, what's needed for me right now is, you know, my bardic inspiration. Like that is what I need to like make sure that my crew is in a place where they are as strong as possible and where they feel supported and they feel safe to express themselves. And so it's like this journey of just like the way that I see myself, the way that I see myself as a creator and as a creative has changed and it's not made me any less creative. It's just like changed my focus, I think, because it's like, I think that the collaborative aspect of animation is incredible and I, and I find it so fulfilling in a way that's like, like I said, that shared imaginary world that you're all building together. I love that part. I love that like, I get surprised by the world and by the characters because of the contributions of other people. Mm, it's one cool. of my favorite things about animation. So changing the strategy from being like, you know, I can take them, bring it on to being like, all right, my job is to like, try and uplift people and try to like inspire people and try to make sure we're all going in the direction we need to be going. But it's not, I don't know, it's not the like, you know, scrappy rebel that you think you'll be. It's it's something I, I think I've grown a lot through the process and be the bard. It's reflected I think in, it's what you're trying to yeah, say. Exactly. Be the bard people. It it sounds like like a dungeon master when mm -hmm. you're the way That's that you're true. you're There's describing it. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. giving it making sure that that your team has all the information that they need to go off and be successful. Yeah, absolutely. But in so many them. ways, they, even though you're kind of like setting the scenes and, you know, kind of telling everyone what the rules of that moment are, it still is you're setting the stage for them to be able to express yeah. their own character and their own stories. So like, that's kind of how it, yeah, it is more like being a DM. Um, Do you think now that uh, uh, you, I mean, have you ever DM'd before? I DM'd, I did a, a one shot in the world of our first uh, our first campaign. So Molly wanted to like take a turn as a player, and I DM'd a like a two session, just kind of like mini adventure. Mm -hmm. I had a lot of fun with it. It was very very hard. It makes me very very like impressed with what Molly does all the time because she just is like she has this huge brain for lore and keeps it all straight and like yeah. it's it's not easy. Like I, mine was this like pirate island that the gang kind of ends up kidnapped and they have to find their way through it. Um, and I was trying to keep all the information straight and I had written down the pirate stats. Um, but I, for some reason had like dropped a numeral when I, when I wrote their, how many hit points they had. So uh -oh. I gave them like nine or 10 hit points. So and our characters were like level six or so by then. So dealt, dealing a good amount of devil, uh, damage. And so they would like hit these pirates and just obliterate them in one hit because I didn't give them enough <laughs> hit points. So it's like they would hit these pirates and they'd just explode. And it was like, I realized at some point that I've made a mistake, but honestly, at that point, I'm just like, okay, I'll just throw more and more pirates at you and you'll just be like, just hacking your way through them like they're fallen leaves. Um, it's very difficult, but it was a lot of fun. Now you got time to maybe start up another yeah, campaign though. I know. We've yeah. actually been doing, um, it's really cool because I wanted to do something that involved uh, the the medium of Zoom. So sort of like the, the kind of creepiness I think that can come sometime of being like that kind of digital glitchiness that sometimes like really freaks you out when mm. you're when you're connecting with people over digital mediums. So I did a, um, a Tin Candles <laughs> game actually, Ooh, which is candles. like, uh, yeah, which is a lot more free form, um, not quite as much preparation. It's a lot more collaborative between everybody, but it was really cool. We just had everyone like candles on their side and like dim the lights. And then it was just, I did a story about like all of us being um, contestants on a game show and then uh, the world kind of ends outside this big brother house while we're inside and we have to venture out into the world and figure out what happened. And the, the villain yeah. is sort of like on this app, on this like phone uh, social media service that has been sort of like sucking people into it. And so the world is just like empty in this way. And it's like, um, so this is really cool. Like I managed to scare myself so much that night that it's like, I like, I couldn't sleep that night cause I got so pulled into it, but it like, utilize the creepiness of this sort of impersonal connection to like create something that was way more real and way more like I, it was really cool I recommend it I think if anyone wants to do uh like an RPG that's like a little more low preparation and it feels like it kind of like uses the tools that we have at our disposal to its best advantage like I would recommend doing a little tin candle session because it's very fun that's really neat I like the idea of 
uh, rather trying to shoot, like put a, you know, square peg in a round hole of like, yeah. we're going to play this way now, like use the, use the medium in an interesting way. I don't think, uh, yeah. I've considered that, yeah. but that's, that's really smart. Yeah. It's really cool because it's like, you know, we had everyone kind of dim the lights on their side and just use candles. And so you're not really even seeing them. They're just kind of blurs of pixels just in voices. the dark. And then there's something where it's like someone on someone's side, a cat will run by or something will fall over. And all of us are just like, what's happening? You know, like, oh my there's God. A part, Jump scares a plenty. There's a part of the world that you're sharing that you don't have access to. Like you don't know, you, you only know what's in your room. And like, it's, it's, it honestly really adds to the creepiness. Like, I think that it's like, I think it's better than playing in person, honestly. Like D and D, I love the in-person aspect, but like 10 candles, I think like, I, that's why I just, I think it's like perfect for the, for the, um, the medium of Zoom. Yeah, yeah. that sounds fun. And it, I'm almost, I mean, I feel like can the, this whole storyline you're talking about maybe could be like your next project. Yeah, Cause maybe. it sounds really cool. It's going into <laughs> horror, I like that. <laughs> I don't know. I kind of love it. Um, it's very fun. So I want to, I mean, this is, I, I, I love the idea of writing uh, episodic television like you were able to do for these five seasons. And one thing that's fascinating to me is like how, how much were you improvising and changing as you were writing it versus, uh, you know, having like there's dungeon masters who have the entire campaign written out and know exactly what the end is going to be. And there's ones that, Hey, this is our starting point who knows where we're going to end up. And I, I wondered which, you know, where, where was your head at for, for where the show went? I tried really hard to make sure that like, I, I don't know how much of this was inspired by like um, D and D, but I, I mean, I am inspired by the way that Molly DMs and the way she runs our campaigns because she does really let us, if there's two tunnels and we go down the wrong one and she made a really cool setting over here, she's not going to be like, she's not going to force us to go to the thing. Like she's going to let us do what we think we need to do. And so I tried to be that kind of showrunner as well. I didn't want to just railroad things mm. that I was passionate about. Although there were aspects that I was very passionate about. And I was like, I, it's really important to me that I want this to be where we end up, what the relationship is like, what, you know, how the beats fall. There were certain things that I think we all stayed really true to. But I, even when it came to the relationships, like I didn't want to just railroad it if it wasn't working, you know? And so I used the team a lot as a sounding board or just to be like, how is this working? How How is this evolving? What are you contributing to it that makes it work even better than I maybe imagined it working? And so I think that like, it was sort of, um, it really depends on the situation. Like I said, I think sometimes the best thing you can do um, as a leader is to give people kind of a clear, the clearest vision possible. And that means you have to kind of commit to things, even if you're not totally sure. So if it's like, well, what color should this background be? And you really don't know the second you say purple, you mean purple and you mean purple forever. <laughs> if someone asks you, why is it purple? You defend it. And you say like, well, it needs to be purple because of this. And that's like, you taking that on and making sure that like the background painter isn't the person who has to like do that. That's kind of like, again, what I mean by like being both yeah. a leader, but also support in a lot of ways. Um, but I think that it, my favorite parts were the moments when the crew really pulled something out that I didn't expect. Mm. And that happened a lot, honestly, because the crew was very passionate. They really were like invested personally and they added lots of themselves into it. So there were moments like, um, I, I think that like I had an open door policy that like anyone, even if they weren't related to the story side of the show, could come and pitch their ideas to me, oh, cool. which I thought were really cool. We actually used them a lot. I remember we had a um, he was a visual development intern back in like season one, and we did sort of individual pitches. Me and Josie, the uh, story editor, we did pitches to this to the crew every time. At just at various intervals to tell them what the story was that we were thinking where we were going with it and give them a chance to ask questions or even pitch their own ideas and so he actually like pitched an idea of like he was really interested in madame raz and the way that like her experience of time was non-linear mm. and so he pitched us in just like really simple words he was like what if there's a memento episode with madame raz yeah. oh. and i was like oh that's cool and so we like wrote that down and then like three seasons later ended up using it as uh, the episode hero in season four, where she's like working through all these scrambled memories of both the past and the present and the future all at once. And so it's like, again, like I, I think that there are moments, those are my favorite moments, I think, when someone just really 
kind of bring something that you didn't expect. Um, the other story that I like to tell is like, uh, we talked a lot as a writing team, especially about whether or not Micah was alive. And there were times when we were like, maybe he's alive and he'll come back. And then at a certain point, I was like, I don't think he can come back. I think there's too many elements. I think that we need to table the like Mike is alive thing. And, you know, I just don't think it's going to work. And there was like a line in, it was one of Josie's scripts. So it was like the finale of season three. And she had written this line where like they, they're interacting with this dreamlike version of Micah and this fantasy perfect world. And right before the whole world falls apart and he disappears, presumably as just part of that illusion, he has a line that's just like, wait, I'm not. And then in the script, that's all there was. Uh, and I just, I didn't think too hard about it. We went to the record and then Shane Lynch, who was our script coordinator, but was also kind of like, a lot of times like my right hand woman, she was always by my side at the record and like, you know, would give me feedback and, and her thoughts on things. And when we were getting that line from Daniel Day Kim, the actor, she reaches over and she like presses the button for the mic and she's like, I think you should do the full line just so that we get like the, actually I don't know if she pushed the mic, that'd be, but um, she was like, <laughs> maybe, but she was like, you should do the full line and the full line is I'm not dead. And I was like, wait, what? And then like, he does that version of the line and it's the best, it's the best Reed. take. Yeah. And so that's the moment where I'm like, all right, I guess Mike is alive. What the hell? Here we go. Like it, it's these moments of like, um, you know, like trusting your crew to bring something to the table that is like, that you maybe didn't expect, but that like really does add something. And so it's just like the moments when like, it was just, I, I really, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. It was just kind of letting people run with it and, and, and add to it in their own way while still trying to be, you know, you know, make sure that the parameters are set and more than anything, make sure that the, I think as long as you know what the core of the story is, you know what the heart of it is, what themes are you're trying to keep consistent. So it's like, no matter what happens, everything always comes back to this one thing. And you're all moving towards one point together. So like, you have to be the compass for that. But also like, I think that there is room for these little happy accidents to happen, for these evolutions that you didn't expect, as long as it all ties back into that same core. Mm -hmm. And like, honestly, it's something that I think happens even when you're doing an individual project, like on Nimona, my first graphic novel, there would be moments where I would change the plan at the last minute. And like, you know, I would be the night before about to post a webcomic page and I would completely change the dialogues, so like something different would happen than I thought. And then I'd post it and be like, well, that's, that's it. I'm committed to it now. And I think that that's what like makes stories feel spontaneous and fun and like surprising and like, yeah like not like I, I don't know I, I just really enjoy working with that little element of chaos while still trying to it's like rolling a die it. exactly it's yeah. like having like that moment of chance where you don't know if it's yes. gonna work or not and it doesn't matter because you just take what the what the, yeah. the role gives you whatever it lands on, I rolled a one by the way oh, so, oh my god so we're dead oh, sorry oh my god. well uh, <laughs> unfortunately that out. means I have to go you failed at this <laughs> oh my goodness um, but yeah, no, I mean, you might have hoped for another number. You might have had a really cool idea if you rolled a 20. And then you get a one and you're like, well, I'm committed now. It's yeah. And, but that's a story too. Like, you know, yeah, failures exactly. create great yeah. stories. Absolutely. Yeah. But like, so you're, oh, sorry. No, Continue. go. Well, <laughs> I'm just, I'm curious. I mean, you have, there's obviously a very passionate community um, surrounding she and very vocal and everybody, you know, had their their vision for how they they wanted the series or or you know the relationships between characters particularly adora and, and katra did you i won't spoil anything if, if people mm -hmm. haven't finished the series but oh, sorry, how much of, of the of spoilers so sorry <laughs> <laughs> i mean they're the they're everywhere but <laughs> they're everywhere but um how much uh does like seeing what the community is responding to and what the community is asking for refers to the development of the show, if any. It's interesting for us because, um, so cartoons that go through a streaming service are different than the, the amount of time needed to, from the start of production That's to true. when it, it actually airs ahead. is way bigger than it is for traditional broadcast television. So if you're working on a show on a, on a, you know, a traditional network, 
you can be editing and, and ADRing and, and doing retakes right up until I think like a couple of days before it hits the air. On Shira, everything is done six months before it airs, at least. Wow. So, and that's for and a lot of reasons. All the like, episodes. Um, we deliver them the by seasons, but but yeah, like yeah. it is. Um, uh, it, it's something where it's like the amount of time of us conceiving the idea to when people get to see it. I would say, in the quickest sense, it's at least a year and a half, if not a little bit more. So, like we oh, were yeah. writing season five in like October, November, December of, actually it might've even been a little early. I, our writers rolled off before season one even aired. Um, and so we have been like living, like it was us trying to predict what people were going to respond to. And then like using each other as sounding boards and then just like hoping to God that it worked because there's really no time if we're like, this is our favorite character. And then everyone's like, we hate that character. Then like, sorry, you're stuck with it. You can't go back and like, oh yeah. yeah. But I I do think that like, it was really important to me to be sort of like connected to the people who are actually going to be watching it because it doesn't really matter what goes on behind the scenes. What the final product is, is the way that people respond to it. So however they actually engage with with the product, that's what it really is, like no matter what we thought it was gonna be. So when it came to Adora and Catra, it's actually really interesting because I had made a gamble that they were going to be like, that this was going to be a a ship, a pairing, a relationship that people were, would be invested in. Yeah. But we didn't have like much feedback at the time to really tell us if that was true or not. Mm. So it was kind of like something that was like, and it's a blessing and a curse, I think, because you do want to sort of like, I I think right now we live in a really interesting landscape where fans have almost like complete access to us at all times. And like, there are a lot of people who can just tweet their ideas, good or bad, or like their thoughts or, or, you know, harass creators even sometimes. Um, And it's interesting because you have to kind of draw lines for that. A lot of times it is really positive for me. I really enjoy interacting with fans online, but it is something where it's like, you have to keep a little bit of a purity of vision. You can't just, people don't always want the thing that they say they want. And you have to kind of show them the thing that they do want, or you have to be the one to be like, you thought you wanted this, you really want this, hope that yeah. worked. Um, and so it is a little bit of a blessing. I, I think that if I had had access to all of that kind of like uh, that that buzz and and the conversations around it and people's expectations because as soon as people have those expectations you're like well by doing that am I just sort of giving into the expectations by not doing it am I like specifically trying to like you know subvert them and, and making people mad in the process like it, it's weird what it, it you do you are all very aware of just like what people are saying about it um, mm. and the ability to do that in a little bit more of a bubble before anyone has access to it is I I think for us, I think I'm glad that we got that. Um, And then I'm also glad to, you know, have been able to get the feedback that we have gotten. And I think it has affected the show in ways. I mean, I think that people did latch on to Katra and Adora in that first season. And like, I, I feel really lucky and I feel really glad that they, you know, saw what we were trying to do and went with it and followed it and like, are so passionate about it and like that's something that like it was a gamble it was a bet it was a hope that they would love it as much as we did um and the response to season five has like blown me away so i'm just really really glad to have you know this positive relationship with i think the the viewers with the fandom um and and you know because it really is like that's we are that's who we're making it for you yeah. know we want to give them the thing that maybe they didn't know they wanted and and then like show a new way that that could be done a way that like is unexpected and new in its own way even if it is kind of like uh something that is like um really satisfying and fulfilling at the same time and it feels like it was always supposed to happen it's something that's like it's inevitable. Like all threads lead to this one conclusion. Well, I will say, you know, my, my girls really, uh, I have two, two daughters, uh, you know, uh, eight and six, no, nine and, and six now. Um, <laughs> but my oldest, uh, uh nine, she had, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was, you know, a similar relationship, but she definitely has had folks, uh, and friends of hers in her school that, um, 
had this kind of, you know, I, I don't know. That relationship yeah. really spoke to her and it really was like, oh, wait, they're friends, but they're now enemies and but they're still friends and how they yeah. navigate that. It's very oh, I'm almost getting emotional just thinking about it, too, because it feels like growing up. It feels like, yeah. um, you know, taking relationships that have uh, kind of an immaturity to them and then applying maturity to them. And it, I just want to say thank you because it really helped uh, her through some some hard times. Yeah. Oh, oh. That's now really I'm going to be emotional. Lot. That's really sweet. <laughs> Yeah, that's really sweet. I, I mean, it's what like it's what we set out to do. You know, I, I think that like, especially when it comes to friendship and um, and the relationships that we have when we're very young, um, it is something that's like I, I don't see it a lot, even in media that is about friendship. And that's about, you know, how friendship is the most important thing, which I agree with. But I've never seen a story like this in children's media that is like what happens when you lose a friend? What happens when you lose someone who was the most important to you in the entire world? And then as the show goes on and matures, it's like, what, what happens when you don't even know how to define your relationship to that person? Like when it turns out that what you thought was friendship is a little bit more than that. Like, it's like all of those stories are things that like would have made a world of difference to me when I was that age. Like the first yeah. time I, I lost a friend, it was like, I still think that it has hurt more than any breakup I've ever had. It feels like a breakup. It is a breakup. It it's is a breakup. Yeah. like you're yeah. losing Definitely. someone who is a part of you. Um, and like that, it was something I, I needed to show and get into. And when I went back and, and watched that first episode again, like knowing what I know now, but it's pretty amazing. And maybe I was just reading more into it, but I don't think so. Like how much of the complexities of their, their relationship you showed in a really short amount of time. Yeah. Like every time that those that they are together, you can like there's so many just every interaction they have is yeah. rife with complications. And it's it's just fascinating. I mean, it's like I I just wa love watching it from just a storytelling point of view. I'm like, that's pretty yeah. brilliant. I think every aspect of it is just like the concept was always this is one thing I think we did stay really true to is that the concept was always the break, like the breaking apart, the realizing that certain things are not sustainable. And then like the long and, and rocky road to coming back together. And I think that that's a part of growing up as well. Like mm -hmm. there are like, you know, I, I think that there are aspects and like, I relate to both characters a lot, but I, I think that there's something about the way that they're so, they were everything to each other at the beginning of the mm -hmm. show. But like, I think at least when it came to Catra, she was like, she her identity was wrapped up in how focused she was on Adora and that's not sustainable but that's also something that as a young person you go through a lot yeah. and the moment when you realize oh no I love this person more than they love me that is something that like can cause you to crack and splinter and just like become self-destructive or, or destructive towards other people like it is something that's just like the fear of not getting back what you're putting in the fear of not being someone's number one priority when you have so much love to give that's like that has like soured and like that was like something that like i just i haven't seen that story i needed to see that story because of course that's not the end like you have yeah. to like you have to grow up you have to get to the point where you are like okay like, well, one, I think that it's okay to expect that you can find someone who gives back the same amount of love that you put in. I think that that's also an important message, but also to know what that looks like. And that like, just because someone has other friends, just because someone has other priorities, just because they have their own life, those things are not at odds. You can yeah. still love each other as much as you possibly can and put everything in. And like seeing Katra's journey to learning how to do that, to learning how to have her own friends and her own life and like her own world, while still being able to put as much love as she possibly can into this relationship that matters to her and teaching Adora in a weird way to like that she doesn't always have to like give everything to everyone. She can focus on, you know, one or two or three people who she really loves and, and, and like nurture those relationships specifically. And it's like, I think all of those are stories of growing up. It's like the moment when you just realize that like the way your heart before it was broken for the first time the way it worked was not like it has to be broken it has to be broken before you learn how to like have a stronger heart yeah and like that journey is something that's like especially between the ages of like you know like 
17 to like your early 20s like that's I think when it really happens and so like I but like I think that it's also relatable to much younger people as well well that's what I love about what you did is because you you're, you're talking about these things that are usually reserved for that that age period that you're talking about, but you're getting the the bones of, you know, obviously there's adventures and there's all this other stuff that's going to make them really excited about watching this, this, this media, but you know, you're, it's teachable, it's teachable. And I think that is really cool that you were able to take something that is not dramatized for, for a younger audience and show, you know, the unhealthy parts of it, as well as the healthy parts yeah. and how to grow and, 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 uh, you know, be aspirational uh, for those characters. Yeah. And it really worked. Yeah. Yeah. I really do think that kids get that too. I think they, they understand do. a lot more than like we always give them credit for. Yeah. So that's what that was. Yeah. And just showing relationships aren't perfect. Like that's yeah. just like no friendship is perfect. No romantic relationship is perfect. You have Sometimes to you can have dreams things. about, you know, divorcing your, your <laughs> significant other and explain had, it to I had kid. a dream about that. <laughs> 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 and that's all right. I mean, I, th- I think that's really really important right and and you're doing it and so thank you and thank you again for having such a great you know uh we've said it a couple times but like the dna of of dungeons and dragons being like throughout this entire uh project even so much as putting dungeons and dragons play in dramatized in the in the series uh you know was really awesome yeah thank you I i mean both of them i think are just like they've been the backdrop for the growth that i've gone through as an adult and like um and just have like changed the way that I think about stories and, and it's, it's evolved that relationship. So I think they're tied together in a way that, uh, in my head, you can't really extract them. So, um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Thanks for letting me ramble about my, my D and D characters. <laughs> I love it. Are you kidding? <laughs> fascinating yes and if anybody hasn't after the end of this interview have not watched all of shiba go to netflix right now it'll be there for for a long time yes (laughs) Yes. sorry about the spoilers but also uh, oh there's so much more though i'm not sorry (laughs) yeah it's hard to talk about so much more spoiling so don't worry about it yeah yeah Uh, there's lesbians okay go watch (laughs) (laughs) that's all that's all the information what more do you need catch up (laughs) Well, again, thank you so much uh, for all your work on this. Thank you for coming on. Uh, you know, if people want to, you know, follow you or get to know what what your next project is going to be, what's the what's the best way that they can do that? Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Ginger Hazing. Uh, I'm on Instagram as well, although I don't use it quite as much under the same name. Uh, yeah, and as soon as I can announce what my next project is, uh, you'll be the first to know if you're on if you're on Twitter with me. Sweet. All right. I can't wait. I cannot wait personally. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you both so much. This was really thank fun. You. Thank That's you. That's been great. Bye, Noelle. Bye. Bye. Say hi to Molly. <laughs> yes, actually. Yeah. <laughs> He's just like a room over. <laughs> <laughs> then we can say hi, Molly. Awesome. All right. So uh, 